I'm continuing to talk about <clears throat> the baptism of the Holy Spirit with fire. And I was explaining in our last program how this baptism of the Holy Spirit was something that was introduced when Jesus was introduced by John the Baptist. Not just as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, but also as the baptizer with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So Jesus has a double side to it, if you may put it that way. And the, the Lord saw it to be very, in, uh, very important that Jesus be introduced not just as, as a savior. So there you have it. We can't just talk about salvation or talk about the forgiveness of sins and remove being filled with the Holy Spirit because God who is wiser than us, us all, he knows that we will not be everything he intends us to be without us being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit may not, uh, not having it may not keep you out of heaven because it's, it's by faith that we believe in the grace of God to save us. But surely enough, you may be like the children of Israel who entered the promised land, but they could not drive out the Canaanites. And the Canaanites had to stay with them. So we can live a powerless life, yet as God's people. And as I was talking about, I started to talk about what we call the, well, it's well known if you're more of a theologian. I really, I'm, the, I'm now more going to talk about the theology or the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit more than necessarily what's been my experience. Because I know there is somebody out there who may be having questions and I want to address those right now. And in the last program, I was talking about how we established how <clears throat> Jesus in John chapter 20, he, he breathed on the disciples and he said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. So we know that they had the Holy Spirit. But then afterwards, just before he was to be taken away, it could have been a few days later, he tells them now that you have to wait in Jerusalem until you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the John the Baptist baptized with the Holy Spirit, I mean baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now, which would have been 10 days from the time he uh, arose. And so now you see <clears throat> that we have the initial experience, if you may call it, or the salvation for those apostles, the disciples, when they received the Holy Spirit in them, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit upon them to empower them to be witnesses to the ends of the earth of Jesus. And so you see, we can, so those of you who believe in initial experience that everything is received at once, there you have an answer for you. And not everything was received at once. The same Holy Spirit who was in them that was going to produce this, the fruit of the Spirit had not empowered them to be able to be witnesses. It's two different things. So you can have Jesus in your heart, but not have the boldness to share him with people. And that's what I want to come to in the, a, um, Acts chapter 4 and verse 29, how now when they were threatened, the apostles, even after they had been filled with the Holy Spirit once, how it shows that we need a continual baptism of the Holy Spirit for different things we need to do. They had been preaching the gospel, people had been saved, but here now they are being threatened and they are told to stop to preach the gospel. And hear what they, they said, they, they come and they prayed in Acts chapter 4 and verse 29 and on. And he said, that, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word, by stretching forth your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, look at this, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all, look at that, all of them, filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. See, they had been filled with the Holy Spirit and they were speaking in, in other tongues. But now they needed boldness and the answer of God is an, a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. So not only are we to believe that this is very important, but it's actually important in the fact that we need to stay full of the Holy Spirit to be effective witnesses for Jesus. So there you have it in Acts chapter 4 and 29 and 30. And also, it's the, what he says in, in Ephesians chapter 5, where he says that be, do not be drunk with wine where there is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That word is actually be continually filled with the Spirit. You see that? So we need it. And that was even in the context of redeeming the time, in the context of husbands and wives. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just from some what we call spiritual things. You need it for your marriage. You need it for boldness. You need it for redeeming the time. The more of God you have, if I may put it, 
the more you will act like God and the more you will be able to redeem the time. You'll find yourself being able to get so much done with, with more of the Holy Spirit that you have. That's what we read if you study history, not only history, but the Bible carefully itself. Elijah, it says that when he was about to be taken to heaven, Elijah asked him and he said, please let a double portion of your spirit, which was the spirit of God that was upon him, be upon me. And if you study all the miracles that Elijah did, he, Elisha did double those miracles because he had a double portion. So how about if he had a triple portion? How about if he had a 10 times portion than what he had? Jesus was able to do so many works that the Bible says that if the things that Jesus did could be written, the world cannot contain the works. Why? Because the Bible says that he was given the Spirit without measure. That means that there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Jesus that kept pouring and never stopped. So that in all things always he had an abundance for every good work. That's that place of all grace that we read in the book of Corinthians. Paul said that God is able to make all grace to abound towards you. That always having all sufficiency in all things, you have abundance for every good work. You see, we need more and more measures of the Spirit of God. To be, you, you could have been baptized with the Holy Spirit once and you say, I've got it, I'm done. I'm here to challenge you to say you need to stay full of the Holy Spirit. You need to receive more and more measures of the Spirit of God for you to be effective and be able to do everything that God has intended you to do. I hope you're seeing it. Now, we continue as we explain that it's not always that when you feel the, 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 that when you're born again, you also feel the Holy Spirit at the same time. I've experienced that in my own ministry where I've seen somebody being filled with the Holy Spirit and saved at the same time and, and speak in other tongues all in one encounter of just laying hands on them. But which we're going to get to that soon in Acts chapter 10, that it happened with Peter when he went to the house of Cornelius. So yes, there is an initial experience when you can receive everything. But it's not so much of what I'm, I'm aware of. Most people believe in the church that <clears throat> I, received, I, received the, uh, you know, I received Jesus in my heart and I have all the Holy Spirit. I don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't need to speak in tongues. I don't need that. That person is in error. Because there is no way you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit and not know it. And the evidence of it is that sooner or later you are going to speak in tongues. It may not happen right away, not because the Lord doesn't want... He's basically trying to give you the words and you, you are pressing them down because you don't know what they are. So you see, instructions are needed when we pray for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instructions are needed at every single stage of life, of the Christian life. So how a person presents the gospel determines of what people would actually believe God for. If they present Jesus just as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, they will receive Jesus as one who will forgive their sins. But if nobody has ever mentioned that he's also the baptizer with the Holy Spirit, then those people who come to Jesus, they don't even know what the Holy Spirit is. You see that? So because they don't know what it is, they cannot believe him for it. it sometimes it depends also on the hunger of the person. If people are already hungry or they've been prepared before ahead of time, then they can receive more, as we will see in Acts chapter 10. So now here we move to Acts chapter 8, and the story of Philip going to preach in Samaria, and how he preached and even miracles were done, but when, <clears throat> and he never mentioned anything about the Holy Spirit from what I see. So people believed, and they were even water baptized. It's here in Acts chapter 8, and verse um, 12 and on. He said that Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, he said, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. And this is water baptism because we see that the Holy Spirit had not come upon them. Then he said that then Simon himself, who was the sorcerer, believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, look at this, pray for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet it was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. What a baptism. Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. 
Look at that. That shows you a subsequent experience, same of what the apostles had received. They, they had been given the Holy Spirit in John chapter 20, in Acts chapter 2. They are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And now we, hear, we see here in Acts chapter 8 how Philip preached the gospel. They believed. They were saved. They were even water baptized in water, but the Holy Spirit had not come to any of them. They couldn't expect the Holy Spirit. And so you see here, again, a subsequent experience. Now, we move quickly to chapter 10, and we see how <clears throat> in verse uh, 44, Acts chapter 10, verse 44, you are going to see a true initial experience where people can even be filled with the Holy Spirit before you had even gotten them to be water baptized. Let's read it. While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. You see that they were filled with the Holy Spirit as a Pentecost, and they were even speaking in other tongues and magnifying God. And for they, now, 47 says that, Can any man now forbid water that this should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And commanded, he commanded them, this is Peter, to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then pray they him to, to tarry certain days. So now you see here that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was given at salvation as people heard the word of God and believed. But the hunger they had at the house of Cornelius was so great. But also these people had been praying and fasting. So you see, they had been prepared for more of what God had for them. So it depends on how the minister gives it to them. It depends on God what he wants to do. We can make uh, a case upon this. He can fill a person right at the beginning. He can... If they believe God just for salvation and basically forgiveness of sins, he will, they will believe, they will believe in water baptized. But later on, once they're, they, they have somebody who knows what they're doing, they can down lay hands on them and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So hopefully, from a theological standpoint, I hope I'm answering the questions for people who say initial subsequent experience. You see that it can be initial, it can be subsequent, or it can be... Uh, uh, so it can either be both, Acts chapter um, 2 and Acts chapter um, <clears throat> John 20, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter uh, 8. You see all of them are pointing to a subsequent experience, meaning that people receive the Holy Spirit in them. But actually even chapter 8, uh, you know, chapter 2, it explains... Uh, <clears throat> A subsequent experience because in John 20 they were filled they, they, they received the Holy Spirit but they were taught to wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon to empower them in that chapter 2 so that the subsequent experience now in Acts chapter 8 it's even different because at this time they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them at all they only believed and they were all baptized but they had the Holy Spirit come upon them so which you see now they were now they had the Holy Spirit in them and upon them, but after water baptism. But now in Acts chapter 10, we see that the Holy Spirit came upon them. They even started to speak in other tongues. It so astonished Peter and the people who came with him. And Peter said, can we keep these people from being water baptized? Seeing that the Lord has done it in a different way, he has even filled them with the Holy Spirit before we even get to water baptize them, before we even get to give them an altar call. So you see that you can't keep God in a box. But suffice to say, you see the initial experience, if you may call it, where people are filled with the Holy Spirit and have the Holy Spirit in them and upon them. In Acts chapter 10, verse 44 and on, we have Acts chapter 8, where people believe they are water baptized and then wait until they, uh, the apostles come and lay hands on them. So that's a different experience in itself. From salvation, they had believed and even water baptized. But at the beginning of chapter Acts chapter two and John twenty, we see a complete subsequent experience where actually they had the Holy Spirit in them, and they had to wait to have the Holy Spirit upon them. So you, what I'm saying is, you can have the Holy Spirit in you, and not upon you, not be empowered, and not have the boldness, not see the power of God manifest in your life. And yet you have the Holy Spirit in you. You could also have received the word of God and believed and even be only water baptized 
and now have the Holy Spirit. You are still a believer? According to Acts chapter 8, they had to wait. They said that the Holy Spirit had come to none of them. So we can either stimulate or stipulate and say they could have had the Holy Spirit in them, even though the Bible doesn't tell us. All it tells us is that they had believed and they were water baptized. So I can't speak for you and say, do you have the Holy Spirit in you even, even though you believe or not? You see, I can't say that because the Bible doesn't say it. But what I say is that if for you, you feel that after I'm explaining this, Lord, I'm not sure even if I have your Holy Spirit in me. I do believe in you and I've been water baptized, but I don't know if I have your Holy Spirit in you and upon me to empower me to be a witness. But according to Acts chapter uh, 10, uh, like I've said, uh, we had, we had a, a, this, this girl in Washington who came to one of our meetings in a prayer rally and I called people to come to the front and we were laying hands on people. And she's the one later who testified to me. She said that when you pray for me, I was, <clears throat> I received an empowerment. I was, I believed in Jesus and I even started to feel this, a different language come to me. And she didn't know what to do. So she kind of wasn't sure what to do with it. Because there were no instructions. I wasn't planning to get, to get her filled the Holy Spirit. I was just laying her hands on them. But God saw her heart and saw the hunger that she had. She went back a complete changed person. Went and bought herself a Bible. A few days later after the, uh, when we were having a, pra a prayer meeting, just two days after she had been saved, she had, nobody told her, but she had gotten herself a Bible. She had read 30 chapters. When I went to talk to her about being filled with the Holy Spirit, she said that I have spoken those tongues you're talking about. So you see, a, a true picture that testifies to the truth of Acts chapter 10 and verse 44. So what I'm trying to tell you here, I can give you many things, many examples. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. If you really want all that God has for you, you see what Jesus died for you to give you. You will not get into just a regular debate. You will say, Lord, everything you have for me. I've heard Brother Pitana talk about these things and I want all that you died to give me for. God will give you all that you need. <laughs> I, people ask me, say, oh, tell us about the Holy Spirit. Tell us about this. Tell us this. And they will ask me, can you pray for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And I would detect or discern that they were not ready. They were not. They were playing. And so I, I refused. But yet when they really needed it and they were seeking God, he filled them with the Holy Spirit and they start to speak in other tongues. And then I will hear them give me a call and say, oh, yeah. well, now we are speaking in tongues and we are doing this and that. So you see, it's not a matter of a Pentecostal trying to turn a Baptist into a Pentecostal. It's not a, it, it, we need to stay away from, this is very childish. We need to see that Jesus paid such a high price. We have a work to do and we need all that it is required to preach the gospel in power. Because the Bible itself said that we do not come to men with the enticing uh, words of man's wisdom. But in the what? In the demonstration of the spirit and power. That you will not have the, the faith in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. See, actually the Bible tells us to have faith in the power of God. So you see, you cannot say that you don't believe in the power of God. That would disqualify you. Because the Bible tells us we have to have faith in the power of God. How will you have faith in the power of God if you don't believe that the power of God is for our time? <laughs> so, I hope you've heard my heart because I want to quickly move on to other things <clears throat> in this program. So, as I continue, I was saying that the stage after the baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire is spiritual warfare or it's a time of temptation, a time of head-on collision with the kingdom of darkness. And what I mean here on collision, the, the language of the Bible is that, first of all, it's our responsibility to fight the kingdom of darkness. It is not the Lord's. And most time people will spend so much time just saying, Lord, help us, save us. I did the same. I remember after I had been filled with the Holy Spirit and with power and I started to see uh, the demonic. The, I started to see, uh, you know, just a lot of attacks from the enemy and his kingdom. A lot of the enemy trying to tempt me or trying to attack me and all those, all those different things. And I would say, Jesus, please help me. And finally he told me, he said that, if you don't do anything about it, I will not rescue you anymore. That plain. 
And the show me said that Paul said that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. He doesn't say that the Lord wrestles. He doesn't wrestle on our part. The Holy Spirit doesn't come to do things for us. He comes to help us. The same way the coach is not in the game. He's only helping them and coaching them how to play the game. But we are the ones in the game. Jesus finished his game. The Holy Spirit helps us to fight, but he doesn't do the fighting. Oh, this is very huge. You have to understand it because everything we learn in the Christian life, is, it teaches us the responsibility of the authority that God wants to give to us. Jesus said that it is finished. He said, go the same way my father has sent me, so I send you. The same way the father empowered Jesus with the Holy Spirit to go and do what he did is the same way he does for us. And so that is very huge for you right from the start to understand so that you don't waste time trying to get the Holy Spirit to fight for you when he's expecting you to fight the battles because he's already empowered you. Because you see in, in, in Matthew 3, 16, as I read, the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus, he empowers him, and then the same Holy Spirit, the, as a matter of fact, he's the one who said that he drove him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Think of it. The Holy Spirit said, no, since I've empowered you, now let's go see if what you got is really the real thing. That's, really, that's the test to know. Have I really been empowered by the Holy Spirit? You know it by you being tried and tempted and you are able to prevail by the help of the Holy Spirit. But you are the one who say in the name of Jesus, get out. The Holy Spirit, in a way, he comes upon you and you, you rise up in the strength of the Lord and challenge the enemy and say, you will not come here. But you see, but you have to already make up your mind and know that the battle is going to be your responsibility. That's what Paul said. And this is exactly, I don't, I want, I don't want to touch it now. Maybe in the next program, I will touch on the thorn of the flesh. Because even Paul had to learn that lesson. He kept crying out to God and said, please save me from this thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan is attacking me. And God looked at him and he said, my grace is sufficient for you. We have called this something else. <laughs> God was telling him, he said, that I've given you enough grace by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to deal with this messenger of Satan. It's your job, Paul. Not for me. And so you see that. But I don't want to go into that as our time has come to a close. And I want to take time to talk about the greatest miracle of all, which is the beginning of all things. You have to be born into this kingdom that I'm talking about. And the way you do it is by believing in Jesus, because he's the one who gives you the key to enter heaven. And you believe in him by simply putting all your trust in him. The Bible says that if you will believe with all your heart in the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. That's as easy as it is. And the show for it that you really have believed it is by using your mouth and say, I believe in Jesus. And so when I re lead you in a prayer, it's so simply for you to proclaim and make it known that you believe in Jesus. So will you pray with me? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you with all my heart. And I come to confess you in my mouth that you are Lord over my life from this moment forward. Come and save me. Cleanse me from all sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me your own. Thank you for saving me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.